Okay, everybody, we're here. We're going to go ahead and do our next chapter of I'm Tired of Running. This will be part eight, chapter seven. We'll get a drink here as soon as I get one that ain't empty. All right. Chapter 7, Too Cold for Calvary. The older brother stomped off in an angry sulk and refused to join in his join in. His father came out and tried to talk to him, but he would not listen. Luke 15:28, the message. I remember as a young boy going shopping with my mother. That was one of my favorite things to do because since I was the baby of the family, that usually meant that I went with mom shopping. She would buy me something. I didn't even realize where it came from until just now, but I carried out the tradition with my own kids. They were never big fans of going to the store, mostly because their worst fear in life was to see someone out in public that they knew. So on the rare occasion, that they would go to the store with dad, they knew that they would get a treat of some kind. I hear stories all the time of children running off in the stores, getting lost, getting into things, having their names called over the loudspeaker because a frantic mother can't locate them. This was never us. When my mother would bravely venture out into the wild, unknown of the department or grocery store with all four of us kids, we were always right with her. She was constantly told, your kids are so well behaved. And we were. We knew no other way to be. It was always very foreign to us when we were to witness kids going crazy. When they were out in public with their parents. I can recall one time very clearly when I witnessed for the first time a child throwing what we would call a holy fit in the aisle of a TGNY. It was such a great spectacle that it was burned into my little brain for all of eternity. It was a cool September morning on a Thursday at around 9.43 a.m. Now, I really don't remember the date or time of the incident in question. But though it was 40 years ago, I will never forget what took place. My mother and I were walking down the aisle of the store, and at the moment, we were in the women's clothing section. I do remember what products were in my vicinity because that meant we were off to the toy section right before we left. Standing there next to the rack of culottes, I heard the awfulest shriek that my innocent little ears had ever heard before. My imagination instantly, instantly ran wild. Someone was sacrificing a small animal on the altar of capitalism to the gods of the T, the G, and the Y. Or else a poor soul had slipped next to a wet floor sign and had, in the fall, broken both legs and arms in both arms. I was absolutely sure that something horrible was taking place and that I just might be the next victim of whatever horrible, gruesome thing that was happening just 40 feet from me. I did what every frightened little boy would do in that situation. I turned to my mother to see what action needed to be taken. To my surprise, there was no fear on her face. Her imagination had not ran wild. It's almost as if she Hadn't even heard the horrible cries for help, the ear-piercing screams of pain, the noises of one who was surely about to die. No, she didn't react at all to it. In fact, to my terror, we just slowly proceeded toward the chaos that would surely be our demise. When we reached the scene of the crime, I could not believe my little eyes. There was no blood, no altar of sacrifice, not so much as a broken bone or even the need for a small flesh-toned bandage. No. What I saw was simply a boy around the same age as myself. This was no ordinary boy, though. He seemed demon-possessed of biblical proportions. I instantly expected him to stand up and say, My name is Legion, for we are many. And then to rip his clothes off and run through the store, cutting himself with plastic building blocks. He was lying on the floor, kicking and screaming. There were toys on the floor, tears in his eyes, and slobber all over his face. I expected the story intercom to come alive with something like, we need an old priest and a young priest. The weirdest thing of all was apparently I was the only one in this store who could see this happening. I was about to lose my mind. I looked at my mom. She 
was, and she wasn't affected by this demonic display of power. Not only that, but I look at this poor young child's mother, and she wasn't seeing it either. Seeing it either, she was just looking around the store doing her shopping. I can't even remember if Mom bought me anything that day. I was just so glad to escape that place with my life. As far as I could tell, I hadn't been possessed myself. I felt all right and wasn't foaming at the mouth or anything. About halfway home, I couldn't stand it any longer and blurted out to my mother, what in the world was wrong with that poor boy in the store? To which she matter-of-factly replied, oh, he was just a brat. Just a brat is maybe what you thought of when you first heard the reaction of his, this brother who should have been very excited that his brother had returned home. In fact, that may still be your thoughts after you read and heard this story for the hundredth time. It was definitely my first and my hundredth reaction to this young man who had been so faithful to stay home and tend his family's needs to have such a good son in the beginning of this story when his younger brother had broken his parents' hearts, took the money that his family had set aside for him and then just disappeared. We noticed that he was a rock, the hope of the family, a man of honor in the most horrible time in his family's history. Now during the most jubilant era of the story, we see this rock, this man of honor. This last hope is a pouting little boy that runs off and throws a fit because things aren't the way he thought they were supposed to be. Before we get righteously indignant on this little brat, let me ask you a question and I pray that you search your heart first and answer honestly. If you were in a situation, had done what you were supposed to do, made the sacrifices that he had made, walked the path that he had chosen to walk, wouldn't you, in the small recesses of your carnality, wrapped up fully in your humanity, even though in a million years you would never admit to this, wouldn't you at least feel a little like this young man felt? It's straight, it's, oh, I'm not straight, it's all right to feel that way. You aren't alone in this. In fact, there are several stories in scripture that invoke those feelings of human nature in us that we are just a little ashamed of because it's not holy thoughts. I have even heard some people in my life be very honest about these feelings. For instance, the story of Joseph being sold into slavery by his brothers. You know the story, don't you? Joseph was one of Jacob's 12 sons, and his father loved him more than the others. In fact, the way you probably know this story is by the coat of many collars that Jacob gave to little Joseph. Jo Joseph even had a dream that his brothers would bow down to him one day. His brothers ended up throwing him into a pit and sold him into slavery. I had someone tell me once that if that little brat hadn't flaunted his fancy coat and just shut up about his dream, he wouldn't have ended up in slavery. How about the parable that Jesus told of the workers in the field? God's kingdom is like an estate manager who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. They agreed on a wage of a dollar a day and went to work. Later about nine o'clock, the manager saw some other men hanging around the town square unemployed. He told them to go to work in his vineyard and he would pay them the fair wage. They went, he did the same thing at noon and again at three o'clock. At five o'clock, he went back and found still others standing around. He said, why are you standing around all day doing nothing? They said, because no one hired us. He told them to go to work in his vineyard. When the day's work was over, the owner of the vineyard instructed his foreman, call the workers in and pay them their wages. Start with the last hired and go on to the first. <clears throat> How this story plays out is that ones that only performed about an hour's worth of work were paid the same amount as the ones that had labored in the scorching sun all day long. Someone told me, that's not fair at all. The ones that worked all day should be paid more than the ones that showed up later in the day and did almost nothing. It just ain't fair. My reply to that was, didn't they all agree to work for a dollar? What you have is not a problem with the fairness of their wages. What you have is an issue with the landowner's generosity. This may be hard for you to believe, but I'm going to tell you which story in the Bible presents the biggest obstacle to more people by far than any other story given in scripture on this certain subject. Before we go there, I might be wrong. Is this the lady who gave everything she had? It probably isn't, but just a thought. An inscription was above his, above him. This is the king of the Jews. 
Then one of the criminals hanging there. Aha. The thief on the cross. Even better. Good job, Marlon. An inscription was above him. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals hanging there began to yell insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him. Don't you ever even fear God? Since you are undergoing the same punishment, we are punished justly because we're getting back what we deserve for the things we did. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I know what you're thinking. I've, heard, I've never heard anyone speak ill of the thief on the cross that went to paradise. Well, I never have either, so let me explain myself. This goes back to what we talked about in earlier chapters. This is a grace thing. And that is something I believe more people struggle with than anything else. This man that we only know as a thief on the cross next to Jesus had apparently lived his life in wasteful and riotous living. Doesn't that sound familiar? We only know him from these verses in the Bible, but this is not the only place we fear, hear of him. I don't know if you've ever heard this or not, but there is a reference to him earlier in the story of Mount Calvary. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Mark 15, 32, New, Interna New International Version. Did you catch that? Those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. What? Both of them? Surely not. No, you read that right. It wasn't a good thief and a bad thief. A religious sinner and a rebellious sinner. These two men that were placed on either side of the Messiah on the horrible, on that horrible, awful day of judgment and sacrifice both <clears throat> shouted insults at the Lord Jesus. You may think that's terrible, but give me just a few lines to argue that it is not terrible. It's terrific. In this is what happened, and they were both in agreement. When this whole scene started, and yet towards the end of the, these men would rebuke his counterpart in defense of the Most High, then something must have caused the change of heart, mind, and attitude. I believe what caused this shift in thinking, this rebirth in this man's soul, this new outlook, or should I say caused him to look up, was one of the seven things that Jesus cried out from the cross. Jesus, while hanging there on the cross that day, spoke even di seven different times. He spoke to his mother and his disciple. He cried, I thirst. And it is finished. Another thing that makes this man on the cross with Jesus so special is one of the seven things that Jesus spoke that day was directly to this man. Today, you will be with me in paradise. However, what I believe with all my being is that the words that came from the swollen, blood-stained mouth of our Savior that changed this man's life for all of eternity were nine simple words. Upon seeing this Galilean man tied to a whipping post and beaten with a cat of nine tails to within an inch of his life, to see the cruel Roman soldiers drape a robe over his torn back and place a crown of thorns on his head. After hurling insults himself at this man on the middle cross, that had drawn more attention to Mount Calvary than he had ever seen before, after watching those religious leaders of that day screaming and yelling the most horrible things at Jesus, maybe even right after the wayward soul that hung waiting to die by Jesus, <clears throat> looked up to read the mocking inscription above the thorn-pierced brow of the Messiah. The life-changing words came roaring from this broken man, as if they were coming from the roaring mouth of a lion. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What did he just say? Did he just say forgive them? They who had accused him, mocked him, beat him, nailed him to the cross, screamed insults at him. This man is it different. I've never heard anything like this. I've never felt anything like this. His thoughts now interpreted by the cries of another man. <clears throat> Not too far from him. If you are who you say you are, save yourself and us. How dare this man has he not been listening? This is where he defends Jesus. This is where he will ask. Remember me when you enter your kingdom. This is where Jesus speaks those beautiful words of grace into this man's life for the first and last time. Give me a minute to let my mind and keyboard wander a little bit. 
Can you imagine this man entering the gates of heaven that day? What tribe are you from? Might come to question. No tribe. Would this would be his only reply? Who told you that you could come here? Would be the next question. That man. He would say, the next series of questions might be, what man do you mean? Abraham, Moses, Jacob, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, Jehu. Sorry, that popped out of my mouth. That's not in the book. Jehu's not in the, bike, in the book. You're going to have to be a little more specific, child. The new saint would reply, that man next to me, that man on the cross. So how can anybody possibly have a problem with this man whom Jesus saved on this most horrible, most blessed day? Well, anytime someone says that, salvation comes through grace and blank space. Then they have an issue with, his, with this story. When someone tells you that you must be baptized to be saved, speak in tongues to receive salvation, join a church to be sanctified, sign a card to be born again, obey the Ten Commandments to make it to heaven, or be perfect to be saved. They have a huge problem with this thief on the cross. It is this failure to receive grace for what it is, free. That causes us to stomp off into the other room to leave churches, to harm fellow believers, to destroy new converts, to essentially take our toys and go home. We may not be in the toy aisle, the TG and Y, kicking and screaming, but we are brats all the same. This is where this young man was in this story. Let's follow after him with his father and see if we can reason with him. Maybe, just maybe, we will see a change to him like we have seen in the man that stole paradise. Hmm. That is chapter 7. All right. Um... There's a couple good YouTube videos. One where a preacher talks about the, the man on the middle cross. YouTube it. Awesome. And Rhett Walker has a song out titled The Man on the Middle Cross. So I would recommend both of those. Um, it's just like a video form of what Marlon just explained here. So. And I do have a couple things that I'm going to research as questions because it just popped in my head. But. Thanks for getting me thinking, Marlon. All right, let's pray, guys. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we get to spend in the book that Marlon had wrote with the different scriptures and based on the stories of the prodigal son and then the other stories and teachings that you give us throughout the Bible, Lord. Father God, we just pray for us all to come together as the body of Christ to quit saying, yeah, but this one, yeah, but that one, yeah, but that one. Father God, there's a lot of denominations that be that believe in demons. There's a lot of denominations that try to excuse it away. There's a lot of denominations that just aren't there yet, or they're just the ones that won't be there, but they're still saved by the grace that you provided for us through your unimaginable sacrifice burial and resurrection Lord so we just thank you and we pray for the unity within the body Lord that you so desperately call for but our own flesh makes us want to divide from it Father God I think there are a lot of believers and I don't know how you cannot believe that there's attacks of the enemy even Paul said whenever he was talking about the thorn in the flesh he even said and a messenger of Satan sent to buffet me. You never hear a preacher preach on the second part of that verse. You always hear him mention the thorn in the flesh or take a little wine for the stomach's sake. Whenever they're trying to excuse away people that have faith the size of a mustard seed. Father God, please, uh, please allow us to understand, myself included, that that's not of you, that's of our flesh. That is the vision, and that is the enemy using our flesh trying to divide us, Lord. Don't let me fall prey to that. Allow me to be more like you each and every day and less like myself. A cute little rhythmic thing to say if you're trying to write a poem would be more like thee, less like me. 
Father God, but we're not trying to do that. We're just trying to have a conversation with you today, Lord. And thank you for inspiring Marlon to write this book, Lord. And we're also going to pray for those members of the body of Christ who maybe need to just just come back, Lord. Maybe not have so much of a yell butt spirit going on. I do believe that there there is because from my understanding the, the demons do take the name of the action in which they commence. So like a Jezebel acts like a Jezebel. Uh, you know, just anything like that. Pornography, lust, all those, Lord. I believe that the, not only is there a big religious spirit that's in a lot of the American church and a lot of churches around the world, Lord. There's pride. There's envy. There's, I believe there's a yell butt spirit because of the people that every, no matter what is said or what is done, they have to go, okay, yell butt. Father God, please allow me not to ever be one of those. I ain't saying I'm perfect because I ain't. Ain't none of us perfect. But please, Lord, please allow me to never be a yell butter. I'm not sure why that popped in my head, Lord, but that did. But Father God, just be with those brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep us away from that. Be with any of our brothers and sisters in Christ who may be traveling to go to church or to do an evangelistic trip or even our missionaries that are around the world, Lord. The, and please remember our pastors who are fighting the things they're fighting. Be with the church congregations who have had their churches burnt down. I know there are three pretty close to this area up here, Lord. We pray for all of them, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We honor you. Father God, I'm also going to pray for those who have sick in their family, Lord. I'm going to pray for those who had unexpected losses. And I'm especially going to pray for someone that's like family to my family and Alicia and Austin Fraley, Lord, uh, that Alicia lost her husband, Eric, Lord. So just be with that family and continue to just heal their heart, Lord. Uh, there is a new normal for them, Lord, but just give them the, the patience and the peace there. We love you, Lord. We thank you and we honor you and we praise you. We can never thank you enough. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen. All right, everybody. There you go. That is chapter seven. And this is part eight of the series. I love you all. God bless you all. See you next Saturday or the next one.